that's the click you have to give it. And now you're there. <laughs> it's up. I saw the slides. <laughs> okay, we'll proceed with uh, the uh, presentation of the post quantum security of the Evan Mansur cipher by Gordon Alagic, Chen by Jonathan Katz, and Christian Mayens. And uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah, so this will uh, nicely connect to the previous talk because. Um, we are going to look at a very uh, similar setting, except from the uh, viewpoint of provable security. Um, I want to give a, a shout out to my uh, co-author, Chen Bai, who would have liked to give the talk, but couldn't uh, come here because of visa issues. Um, here's an outline of, uh, outline of my talk. I will start with um, some motivation. I mean, I'm in, in the lucky position that a lot of motivation was already covered by the by the previous talk and by Maria's talk in the in the morning. But uh, still, I want to add some uh, a little bit of perspective from uh, from the provable security side. Then I will introduce some concepts and present our results. And in the end, hopefully, time permitting, I will also talk about our techniques. Let's start with the motivation. Um, there was already a lot of uh, surveys of um, of quantum attacks uh, against cryptographic systems. Um, however, I want to um, uh, give give another overview because we we need to to kind of talk about them uh, to compare uh, the different models, especially the the Q1 and the Q2 model. Um, so first of all. Uh, of course, we have uh, post quantum attacks or Q1 attacks, where um, the most um, prominent family is, I guess, based on short algorithm uh, against RSA and discrete log, and these are complete breaks of the systems. Also, um, against symmetric key cryptography, there's um, um, Grover, Grover's algorithm-based attacks and, um, and similar, and these are generic attacks against block ciphers and um, hash functions, for example, but also um, quantum-aided differential and linear cryptanalysis, for example. These are not complete breaks, as we have seen um, in the previous talk and in, in Maria's talk, but they degrade the security compared to classical attacks. The question is, of course, by how much? Um, finally, there's this, this additional Q2 family of attacks based on Simon's algorithm, for example. Um, and these are, for example, attacks against even Mansour and block cipher modes of, of, of operation. And um, these are also complete breaks. However, in this in this strong model, right? And um, as I will argue later, at least um, from the provable security perspective, this is, um, you know, it's it's very strong. It's maybe, maybe too strong, maybe not something that's really necessary to achieve. Now, the main motivation um, is for, for, the, for this work is basically um, this arrow, which for example, has materialized with the um, with the offline Simons algorithm. So the the worry is there could be ideas in these um, in these uh, Q2 model attacks that can be ported to the Q1 model, and then you get um, attacks that maybe are better than a, a plain Grover search attack and have speed ups uh, that are larger than Grover search speed up, as you have just seen. So in summary, um, for symmetric key crypto, of course, um, quantum attacks are far less of a concern than for public key crypto. But still, where possible, uh, we should definitely prove post-quantum security um, to achieve certainty, to, to achieve a higher confidence in our crypto systems. OK, so this, uh, this was the, the motivation. So now let me introduce the necessary concepts. and. Um, we will immediately return to basically um, the question of what post-quantum security actually is, especially from a provable security perspective. So, I mean, the, the naive idea is just, you know, it should be security against quantum attacks, but um, what are realistic quantum attacks? 
and uh, there are these two competing um, uh, models, right? The Q1 model and the Q2 model. So let's try to uh, be a bit more formal what exactly that means. Um, so first of all, what's, what's common to the two models is obviously that quantum computation is allowed for the adversary. That's kind of the defining property. Um, one implication that this has is that if we look at an idealized model, like, for example, uh, as in the previous talk with the, with the ideal permutation, then we need to allow quantum access to the oracles that represent public cryptographic algorithms. And this is, for example, in the ideal permutation model or in the random oracle model. There, um, these oracles represent really an algorithm that you can look up on the Wikipedia or whatever and implement on your quantum computer. So this needs to, um, the quantum queries need to be allowed uh, in, in these algorithms, in these uh, oracles. Now they start to differ, and that's basically because of two different approaches. In, in the Q2 model, the approach is, okay, um, uh, how strong of a, a security model can we imagine? Um, of course, the strongest thing is to allow quantum access to everything where we still have non-trivial um, security possible. And this, for example, includes quantum access to online primitives. So, for example, um, we would then allow quantum chosen plain text attacks and quantum chosen ciphertext attacks, quantum chosen message attacks, etc. However, um, in the Q1 model, uh, we restrict to classical access of these online primitives. And um, the, the reason why this is, 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 uh, makes sense is basically that our main concern is that our devices that we use today, I mean, this one, it uses uh, crypto, and I'm pretty sure it doesn't do quantum computation. So because these online uh, primitives or these online queries model um, computations performed by the honest parties with the crypto system, it's reasonable to restrict to classical queries only. So in summary, um, from a provable security perspective, Q2 is somewhat unrealistic, um, and Q1 should be sufficient. One interesting challenge in the setting where there's an idealized primitive in the Q1 model is that there's a mix of classical and quantum oracles because online primi uh, offline primitives are quantum and online primitives are classical. And this will uh, feature in the Ibn Mansour setting. Now, I almost can skip the slide because Evan Mansour was introduced a couple of times already, but maybe somebody um, is here that wasn't to the, to the other talk. So let me introduce it one more time. The Evan Mansour cipher is an extremely simple cipher that uses um, a cryptographic permutation that is modeled as an ideal uniformly random permutation P uh, from n bits to n bits. And uh, this is public, and, and the cipher is constructed by um, XORing the key into the message, then applying the permutation, and then XORing um, here the same key, but one can also use a fresh key um, one more time. And sometimes this is the minimal um, construct construction of a block cipher. I mean, there's literally only three operations if we view at this, if you view, view this uh, permutation as monolithic. Um, however, because, uh, despite its simplicity, it has um, found quite some applications. In particular, Evan Mansour-like constructions feature in, for example, um, Elephant, which is submitted to the current ongoing NIST lightweight competition. How about security? So, um, uh, as a reminder, the, the permutation is considered ideal, so an attacker needs to make queries to this permutation. And an attacker is also allowed queries to the cipher. And the right security notion for such um, a block cipher is that of a pseudorandom permutation. So the task of an attacker is to distinguish um, the cipher from a random permutation. So now let's look at the, an adversary that makes QE queries to the cipher and QP queries to the permutation. In the classical setting, um, it, it is this. Uh, a result that has been known for a long time that the product um, the product of um, the queries to the permutation and the the, the cipher uh, needs to be two to the n of, or of the order two to the n to achieve a constant distinguishing advantage. 
um, as we've uh, seen a couple of times already, and as I've mentioned before, in the Q2 model, in this quantum access model, um, there is an, uh, a complete break of the cipher. So that's the Simons algorithm-based attack that breaks it using order of n queries. Now the question is in Q1, right? There are um, attacks known, as we have seen, but there's no... Uh, currently, no, uh, or before our work, there was no pr a proof of security in the Q1 model. Okay, so let me move on to presenting um, our results. And um, that basically uh, consists of a proof of security for the even Mansour cipher in the post quantum setting or in the Q1 model. So, um, let me go through the theorem together with you. So um, we have two random permutations, P and R. P is the primitive, and R is the random permutation that um, the cipher should be indistinguishable from. And we have the Evan Mansour cipher that's constructed using P. Now, any quantum adversary that makes at most QP queries to P, quantum queries, and QE classical queries to uh, an oracle O can cannot distinguish the situation where O is equal to the Evan Mansour cipher from the situation where O is equal to the random permutation with an advantage larger than um, the one that is shown on the slide. This result was already shown by Jaeger, Song, and Tesaro um, last year for adversaries that in advance of their execution declare a list of uh, queries that they will make to the cipher. And our result is for um, for the adaptive setting where the adversary can adaptively choose which inputs to query to the cipher. Um, the um, bound looks a bit uh, weird, in particular because of the sum, right? Um, but it turns out that in a very natural setting where the number of um, online queries is much smaller than the number of off offline queries. Um, it is actually uh, tight in the, in, in the sense that it uh, tightly characterizes the query complexity of breaking uh, Evan Mansour. And that's because of it, it matches the um, BHT and offline Simon's Salmon, Salmon algorithm. Okay, so this was the result. Now there's, um, I guess, plenty of time left to talk a bit about our techniques and uh, also a bit of, about our technical results, which uh, might come in handy in the future as well. First, let me talk a bit about the general approach. So in the classical setting, um, security proofs for even Mansour-like ciphers usually use what I would call global techniques. So, for example, uh, a, pro a popular approach is basically to define some bad events that could happen in terms of the query transcript of an adversary. And now basically prove that these bad events only happen with a small probability. Um, another technique is the so-called H coefficient technique, and it also kind of uses... Um, let's say, non-local information about the query. So uh, information to, that joins information from de several queries together uh, to uh, reach the result. And these things are unfortunately not something one can do in the quantum setting. Because if you have quantum queries, you cannot compile in general a query transcript. So one solution to this uh, conundrum uh, that was recently proposed is Jandri's um, compressed Oracle technique that allows for, um, in some sense, it, uh, it allows to compile a query transcript, but it only works for random functions. At least currently, it is not known how to do it for any other family, interesting family of functions. So because of that, we kind of had to resort to something more primitive in, in some sense, which is a hybrid argument. So there, um, you just gradually change the um, real setting to the ideal setting and hope that um, the distinguishability of adjacent hybrids is not too large. So let me try to explain how we apply the hybrid argument here. So first of all, we um, 
split up the adversary into QE plus one stages, one before the first query to the classical oracle, which could be the cipher or the random permutation. This is the task to distinguish the two. Um, then one between the first and the second, one between the second and the third, etc., up to one extra stage after the last query to the classical oracle. So here, um, I want to note that each stage can make an arbitrary number of queries to the quantum oracle for P, except that the total number of queries is bounded by some uh, number QP. So basically, the adversary can adaptively uh, choose how to distribute the quantum queries between the different stages. Um, now, the naive idea would be, of course, to replace the instances of the cipher by random permutation by the random permutation one by one. So we start by replacing the first call with the random permutation, then the second, etc. Um, however, there's a subtle issue with consistency of the oracles that's that come up. And I want to explain that in, in the next slide. But first of all, let me already present the solution. And it's a bit, um, let's say, um, naive sounding, but it works. It's basically post to postpone the problem um, until it goes away. It sounds magical, but it works. So here uh, is a little bit more detail. These are our hybrids. So indeed, the, the ith hybrid has the first i calls to the classical oracle um, be answered with the random permutation r. And afterwards, we switch to answering with the Evan Mansour construction ek. However, in addition, we need to um, modify the permutation a little bit uh, from that point on where we switch to the um, even mensual cipher. The reason why we need to modify this is um, the following. So imagine that you have an adversary that just breaks the cipher completely and recovers the key. Then one thing one can do is first make a couple of random queries, then run this attack to recover the key, and then check whether the first couple of queries were actually answered by the Evan Mansour cipher. So that I can now do a, a posteriori uh, because I have recovered the key. And this is of course unfortunate because, um, I mean, of course we don't think that it's possible to recover the key with a, with a limited amount of queries, but we don't want to use the result that we are trying to prove uh, to show that basically um, the adversary cannot uh, notice the switch from uh, the random permutation to the cipher. So therefore, we make these modifications uh, to create um, a permutation P tilde that slightly differs from P. Now, the problem is, of course, that P tilde gets messed up more and more as I grows. So we replace more and more queries. Uh, P tilde gets messed up. But if you look very closely, um, there are also fewer and fewer calls to P tilde. And in the end, um, it's gone. So uh, there's nothing to worry about. Um, so on a technical level, there's two steps in each transition from one hy hybrid to the next. And the first one is to replace the cipher by a random permutation and to repair this, uh, this permutation to P tilde at the same time. And the second step is to replace one call to P tilde by a call to P, right? Because we only want to use P tilde after the first call to um, EK. And these two steps translate into two technical lemmas. The first one is one we call a resampling lemma for random permutations. And the second one is a reprogramming lemma in terms of the expected number of quantum queries. Let me quickly tell you what these are. So the resampling lemma is a permutation version of what we used to call the adaptive reprogramming lemma in a work by Alex Brillo, uh, Katrin Hövelmans, Andreas Hülsing, and myself. And um, this is basically um, a game where um, an adversary needs to detect whether the permutation has been modified, but in a way that's consistent with the distribution of a random permutation. And um, I don't think I have time to uh, describe the game in detail, but um, we can show that this kind of change in the permutation can only be detected with a small advantage. Um, the second technical lemma is um, uh, an expected number of queries version of um, 
so-called blinding lemma that we introduced uh, in earlier work with uh, with Goran Alagic, Alex Russell, and uh, Fang Song. And there, basically, um, the adversary can uh, decide everything except that re some reprogramming happens that's randomized, and the adversary needs to find out whether it happened or not. And the important part here is that we get about in the terms of the expected number of queries, because as, if you remember, each stage of the adversary could make an arbitrary number of queries, except that it was bounded by the total number of queries, and the sum was bounded. So um, somehow this expected number of queries um, avoids us to, to get another loss in, uh, in terms of the number of classical queries. So um, I don't think I have time to talk about the uh, reprogramming game in detail, but here really the adversary supplies a function, then it's reprogrammed and the, or, or not, and the adversary has to detect. And this uh, game has um, the typical advantage that you would expect in a setting where a uh, Grover search is, is possible. Okay. So um, I think it's time to summarize. So we have proved the post-quantum security of the Evenman sewer cipher. Um, and this is in this Q1 model um, that is um, should be sufficient for a security of classical cryptographic algorithms. And I mentioned applications of um, even Mansour like constructions. The reason why I didn't go into detail is because these applications, at least, for example, the applications to Elephant and also the uh, ISO standardized um, Mac Chasky, um, they actually use generalized versions of the even Mansour construction. Also, this work by Jaeger et al. that proved the non-adaptive setting, they can actually prove um, security of the FX construction that you have seen in the previous talk as well. Um, and for this, we have some follow-up uh, work by uh, the same set of authors plus Patrick Struck. And I guess this will be on ePrint soon, <laughs> I hope. Um, finally, I want to slip in a shameless piece of, of um, uh, advertisement. So I expect to be able to open a, a PhD position in fall in uh, beautiful Copenhagen. Um, so if you know anybody, please them, ask them to apply. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for ending with the See you on ePrint soon. <laughs> uh, line um, questions. Go on. Yes, yes, please. Use the microphone. Otherwise, we won't hear you. You shout. The microphone is here. It's a very short question. Uh, I was just curious about the probability of a distinguishing advantage in in the adaptive setting that you guys showed versus the non-adaptive. Was it the same or was there a, a gain? So um, it's definitely the same up to the constant. And the constant is almost all, uh, the same. I, I don't remember exactly, but I think the constant is within a factor of two of each other. So uh, it's really the same amount, which is surprising in some sense because their technique is completely different. Returning my question from just just to keep you alive here. Um, <laughs> returning to the quantum models, Q1, Q2. How likely is it for a hardware designer to understand whether they are probed classically whether their hardware itself is probed classically or quantumly, is there a chance to detect this in some in a certain way? Because the difference between the models where you can query with a quantum signal or with a classical signal, yeah. Right. Um. Yeah. I mean, there's there's this um kind of it's almost a meme. There's this this idea of the frozen smart card where you can kind of force it to behave like a quantum um device. I don't think it's, personally, I don't think it's very realistic. In particular, if I have my phone in my pocket, it's very warm 
for quantum standards. <laughs> and so I'm pretty confident that it doesn't do quantum computation. I think um, if you can achieve Q2 security without a lot of extra cost, you should definitely go for it because what's the loss, right? And uh, and then you don't, you, it's the kind of, you know, you can forget about uh, that worry, at okay, least. Definitely yeah. agree. On the other hand, we saw yesterday morning that they don't attack your smart card in, while it's in your pocket. They have a lab. We, we have a lab. Yeah. It's taken out. And it's that's where we, <laughs> security is, will, will be uh, tested uh, to real adversaries. Yeah. That's, oh, that's true. But um, still, I think uh, the, the main picture that I at least have uh, in my mind is um, basically a lab where somebody tries to take a cheap classical device and try to force it to behave it behave quantumly versus the insane engineering feats that people try to go through uh, to try and create an actual quantum computer. So somehow this gives me a lot of confidence that there's no accidental quantum computation. Um, somehow. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, thanks for the nice talk. I was just curious, have you thought about how um, the best attacks would change if you could pre-process the permutation in Evan Mansour? So say the attacker looks at the entire permutation in advance, stores some advice, and then and then the attack is is as Q1 here. Right. That's a very interesting question. So that's basically um, this class of models that's called uh, auxiliary input or random Markle model. And in this case, it would be auxiliary input ran random permutation model, right? Um, I, I don't know uh, how it changes. And um, one thing that I can say is that um, as far as I know, um, the results that are known for auxiliary input models, they're quite complicated to prove. And in particular, uh, some of them use Gendry's compressed oracle technique. And this, of course, poses a challenge in the setting with a random permutation. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you again.